but in five years, that may not be a joke anymore. It may truly be uh, an accurate statement. If you look at the technology that is, is in the trucks today, there are uh, significant changes than there were 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, the trucks are tracking thousands of data points. The trucks are technology platforms today. Uh, they are not just power plants and transmissions that move 80,000 pounds down the road. There's a substantial amount of technology in them, a uh, substantial amount of technology. Welcome to the New World Podcast, where we delve into the ever-changing and accelerating pace of global change and its impact on our lives. I'm your host, John Paul Flores, broadcasting live from the New World Studio. Today, we're diving into the world of AI and automation. As an enthusiast and expert in lead generation, I will guide you through understanding and leveraging these technologies for your business and for your personal use. And don't forget, AI and automation might be unstoppable forces, but that doesn't mean you are powerless. Tune in to learn how to make them work for you and not the other way around. But first, let's meet our guest. Welcome to the New World Podcast, where we navigate the changing world around us. I'm your host, John Paul Flores, specializing in lead generation and AI automation, here to help you understand how our world is changing what it means for you. As you all know, without an efficient supply chain, everything comes to a halt, literally the whole world. That's why today we are thrilled to have Nate Johnson, or who we can call the mayor, the innovative CEO of GLCS Inc., join us. Nate is also the host of the Driving Forward podcast. You should all check it out. It's a podcast dedicated to exploring the latest tracking trends and delivering innovative solutions to the challenges faced by the industry. Nate is also known for his dynamic approach in the transportation sector. And in this episode, he'll share his insights on how advancements in technology and AI are reshaping the industry, uh, the challenges and opportunities and these changes present. And again, Nate, it's an absolute pleasure to have you join us on the show today. Thanks, John. I appreciate that. By the way, uh, before we continue on the in-depth questions, can you give us a quick intro on who Nate Johnson, the mayor, is, what your experiences are, your <clears throat> expertise, and what keeps you busy yeah. these days? I don't I don't know on how quick it's going to be, but I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, yeah, I've been in transportation logistics 28 years. Uh, I started as a driver and uh, kind of grew from there, fell in love with the industry, uh, moved into operations and safety, eventually moving into a, a general management role for another uh, trucking company, grew that trucking company to a substantial size, uh, owned my own trucking company for a while, <clears throat> uh, closed that in 2009. Uh, ran another trucking company. So really, you know, the first half of my career was in operations and executive roles at uh, in ownership as uh, in, in transportation logistics, both on the, the asset and non-asset side of uh, transportation logistics. And then uh, in 2011, uh, I, I had always been a technologist throughout this, always been very edgy with, with technology and applying technology. And in 2011, I shifted from uh, being an operator to uh, moving to a technology company. And I, I led uh, the consulting side of one of well, the largest TMS platform at the time uh, for uh, almost six years. And um, I, I've been into... At this point, I'm, I'm coming up on close to 2,000 different organizations I've visited and, and helped uh, with their operations, with their technology processes, just advising on how to do business. Um, but in 2016, then I started GLCS. And GLCS, uh, first and foremost, is a managed services company. So we are a... Uh, an IT services company. We, we help companies with their technology. And 
We help companies with their processes. We help them identify their technology. We help manage their, their technology. So we can become a IT services or IT department. We can enhance an IT department. Um, we can streamline the processes. We can help identify the technology that a company needs. We can help select it, impl implement it, and support it. And then we also are uh, an integrator as well. We have uh, um, nearly 100,000 or actually a little over 100,000 units on our integration platform and, and uh, uh, hundreds of customers on it as well. That's fantastic. And how was the technology change, especially for the last decade? Because I'm sure it changed a lot. So for the last decade, uh, it's it's definitely changed. For the last 30 years, it's substantially changed. So when I first started in the industry, I was dispatching on paper, uh, on card filing systems that we had throughout a, uh, a office. So that story is interesting because we'd, we'd keep everything logged and then we would uh, there would be somebody who would enter it into a counting system that we had. But in the last 10 years, uh, I would say, you know, what we're starting to see uh, in transportation logistics is uh, a decoupling of solutions where, you know, if you look at a path from 20 to 10 years ago, it was very much so how many solutions can I get into one vendor? And now it's how many solutions can I uh, decouple? So I don't want every solution in one, one particular solution anymore. I want these decoupled solutions and I want someone who's an expert at this one specific process or this one specific field. And we've seen that largely come around. Uh, also, you know, the invent of AI, uh, the deployment of AI, that's a, a, a massive utilization. It's been around a long time through machine learning, um, but the, the invent and, and deployment of, of uh, uh, the NLPs, you know, we're starting to see more and more of that, but largely, um, you know, how AI is deployed has has certainly helped out. It's 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 a buzzword that I don't like to throw out this early, but uh, given you know kind of what we're here to talk about, I'm I'm putting it out there a little early. So, um, and it and it has helped out the industry a lot through predictive maintenance requirements through uh, uh, cameras and whatnot. So th those are are the primary um, areas I would I would focus on um, safety uh, safety um, solutions those type of things but uh, uh, the last ten years have certainly been interesting we've seen a lot of things change as far as the major vendors the major suppliers in the space don't have the same market share that they once did ten years ago too you know. Uh Open AI basically made AI mainstream and a buzzword. I mean, they kind of did that to the industry. Uh, did you see that when it was re released, businesses are more open to the idea of you integrating technology into their uh, businesses? You mean since AI was released? No, since uh, AI became more mainstream or became a buzzword. Uh, I would say everyone's been in, open in integration for a long time. I don't know if that's been since AI has been around. So what, what you what you get with with transportation logistics is you have a lot of disparate systems and you have a lot of data flowing around. And I mean, when you track the amount of data that that we're capturing in and out of trucks, um, many suppliers, many many shippers. Uh, customers, when you get down to it, are looking for updated information on trucks, typically on a minute by minute or, or five minute or 15 minute basis. So you're pulling this data down from a truck in a massive quantity. And a lot of times the ELD platforms are giving you this data on every couple seconds if you want it. You can pull it down on whatever cadence that you, you wish. And so you have that level of data available to you <clears throat> which allows you to do a lot of things. It allows you to create um, predictive analytics around driver safety performance. And, and that doesn't even, you know, create a scenario where, 
you know, you're providing a customer value solution outside of your, you're delivering things on time. But it creates a, a solution where you're able to do driver performance metrics. Um, you're also able to uh, um, enhance driver performance in the truck and around the behavior and the performance of that truck that that shows them I can I can increase my fuel consumption, how they behave in the truck and how they're they're maneuvering the truck. So increasing that fuel mileage is thus um, increasing the the profit of the truck, which is you know fuel being the second, potentially the first largest expense to a motor carrier, uh, that's a big deal. So um, all of that data coming down on a, on a very quick basis, there's a desire to use that data and determine what's the best way to uh, to use that data. So there's always been an open ended. Um, open-ended way of, of tying in solutions to other solutions on in transportation logistics. Uh, it's never been an issue with that whatsoever. The speed of being able to do it is increasing it, especially when you look at uh, what I call non-complex data versus complex data. And that's not a scientific, that's a Nate term, not a, not a, a scientific or an industry term. And what I mean by non-complex data is you have a, a subset of APIs and another subset of APIs, and those APIs, for the most part, will marry up together fairly simply. You're not dealing with a legacy system, which there are a lot of legacy systems in transportation and logistics. And the, those subsets of APIs just simply will plug in fairly easily. So there are certain solutions out there today and there's many of them that are up and coming that plug in to each other fairly quickly and we're seeing a lot of them come out and they make integrations easier and somewhere down the road in the next five three to ten years I, it's hard to say how fast ai is gonna uh, expand it's hard to say how fast or what limiters we're gonna hit with any type of technology we eventually hit a roof you know, where is that roof at? We don't know yet. We haven't hit it. Uh, but we will hit a, a ceiling uh, in in our AI journey as as a society that's that's going to going to make it more difficult for us. And, and so let's say it's it's five years down the road, because that's what I've been typically socializing, that AI now becomes able to take complex integrations and start making those happen. So maybe those legacy systems that it couldn't integrate to in the past, it starts learning how to normalize that data that it couldn't normalize in the past. Um, how it does it, I don't think I can conceptually understand that outside of its just potential. So, um, so the industry's always been open to to integrations and tying in solutions where it where it sees benefit. It's fascinating that you actually shared some, some example on how the data is being processed. So thank you for that. Uh, is there some parts of your industry uh, that is currently not automated, um, mostly being done manually that you think in a few years would be automated or be integrated with technology as well? There's a lot of areas that are are, are being looked at for automation or there's there's people who are taking on challenges. Um, you look at, at appointments, for example, very difficult to uh, automate appointments, but there's a few companies like Qed that's taking on appointment automation. <clears throat> it's not easy. There's a lot of people involved in, in appointment automation. You look at uh, generative AI capabilities, especially when you're we're, when you're putting together phone bots or attendants, phone attendants, and what they can potentially do if you train them right uh, to interact with with customers or vendors to track equipment or track customers or vendors. Um, so, in the case of a of a of a freight broker. You could qualify a a carrier through a uh, through a, uh, a phone attendant that you've trained well, 
and then pass that on to a human. Or you could even book a load through a phone attendant if you train it well. You have to trust the solution to do it, which is is the hard part. And you know, looking at our, we have some friends at a company called Happy Robot. They've they've done this. They've deployed it. They have several use cases of it. But you know, largely you have to commit to that type of a, a solution, which is is hard. You know, being able to, we, we've seen scenarios where this has not worked out well. You know, we've seen the 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 twelve dollar airline tickets. Uh, we've seen the, where where the solution does not act appropriately, and you know we ha- you have scenarios where uh, you're able to exploit a uh, a glitch in the system and get something for nothing. So people are always concerned about that, um, a- a- as they should be. And as you're adopting new technology, you want to be be cautious about that. And as always with AI, you're always concerned about you know. These manual processes, you know, what's the human condition of it? You know, is it replacing people? Is it not replacing people? Do we want it to replace people? You know, is this something that we want people to talk to? You know, inherently, you could, in theory, have a bot uh, talking with your drivers. But every fleet I've ever spoken to about this, and I agree, you wouldn't want that. You you definitely want uh, your, I mean, if I had drivers working for me, I certainly wouldn't want them talking to an AI bot when they should be developing an interpersonal relationship with someone in my office. So, you know, as far as manual processes go, I think that's on a per case basis because many of those processes can be automated but there comes a cost with automation and based upon the size of your organization, you may or may not choose to automate that cost. And then you have that interpersonal side where, sure, we can automate this, but we don't really want to. Uh, we want to have that conversation. Yeah, plus if you think about it, the risk that you're taking, especially if you're a tracking company, you're taking a risk of hundreds, if not millions of dollars especially if you're communicating with this voice at send then. I mean, it's not just a low risk $12 ticket that you're potentially uh, losing or screwing up. It's a higher cost than that. Yeah, potentially. I mean, in the case of, uh, and I don't remember which airline it was, but you should be booking a $1,000 ticket and you're getting a $12 ticket. So I don't know how many dollars they lost in that. But in this particular case, you're dealing with people. And like I always say with people, you know, that's that's hard to win back a lost transaction. So if you have a driver or a customer, if you lose a, a million dollar cust- a million dollar a year customer, that's potentially a lifetime or at least a, a cycle, you know, a three to five year loss of of engagement with a customer so five million dollar relationship that you lost there all because you deployed that now i'm not saying that it's wrong um because it is a wave of the future and it is a, a potential there are roles of it for example appointments uh scheduling that appointment there's absolutely nothing wrong with calling someone on a dock who could care less who's calling them what what gets interesting is when you have the debate on there's the opposite side of that where they have AI bots receiving phone calls to make appointment and you call them with an AI bot to make a phone call. And uh, once again, our, our friends at Happy Robot have called that a soft EDI transaction where you have a bot and a bot talking with one another. And it's if it hasn't happened already, it's going to be happening soon. Um, where we have we have attendants talking to attendants, and uh, you know we don't actually have humans interacting with another. It's a computer that's talking verbally with another computer. And it's slower than than what a digital transaction would happen, but it's still very functional, um, very very functional. And and especially with the development cost that they're putting in AI right now, uh, GPT. Or I don't know if you've seen this article. Article, they spent 110 million developing it, and for the GPT-5, they're now planning on spending more than two billion dollars. That's a lot of improvement, and I think it's gonna be you know ten times better, if not five times better, and faster in terms of 
being able to call someone and there's no latency on their response well two billion in developing something that I don't know what their current user base is but it grew to um, the largest user base in the shortest period of time um, I don't recall what the statistics was it was something like a million 8. a million in five days. Yeah, yeah, I, I, but the visits to the the website was something like uh, um, I can't remember. It was like one point eight billion visits with an average duration of eight eight minutes or something like that. Um, at least that's the statistic that I saw. It's probably old data too, but that's when it first launched, and I think that might have even been GPT three point five. So. Um, but five at a $2 billion expense probably is pretty cheap when you really get down to it. I mean, the, the capability of it. So if you really roll back time and say, you know, the average human, the people who interact with chat GPT or, or any of its competitors didn't really start doing so until February of 2023. I mean, that's really when it started going, maybe I think it was February of 2023 um is when it might have been march but um once again i don't have the data directly in front of me um so this has been out a, a little over a year to the average consumer but yet it occupies many of our daily lives whether you know it or you're not but the technology that you're working with is in many apps that you have on your phone uh, whether or not you use the product directly or not, I, I use it frequently for a variety of things. Um, you know, I, I don't use it in a way that many other people use it. I, I typically will have it give me a lot of ideas. <clears throat> I still like to write, you know, the vast majority of my own things, but I'll, I'll get all kinds of ideas from, from chat GPT. And I know from a marketing perspective and from a legal perspective, I use it frequently and our, our marketing team cer certainly uses it uh, quite a bit too so you know i noticed that there's two types of people when it comes to chat gpt there's someone who just says uh, write an article for me about this topic and i call that a lazy person and the smart <laughs> person is the one that asks hey please give me some ideas or give me a starting point on how to do this and then you just add that human part to make it even better. I think right. that's the best use. Yeah, I, I agree. There's certain areas. So that's especially if you're going to have it right for you. Um, I get I get the ideas. So I'll, I'll lots of times write something and I'll, I'll give it a ton of data and I'll say, give me, you know, 10 thoughts about this or that. And then I'll, I'll write because I, I put something up on social media nearly daily. And then I do, you know, multiple pod, I do driving forward and then I do uh, a Tuesday monologue as well. So, you know, I, I, there's a lot of content that I have to put up and it gets hard to make that all happen. Um, so <clears throat> so to, to just create all of that sometimes gets to be hard. But you take it from a legal perspective, uh, you get a contract and you want to review that contract and maybe, you know, maybe you don't fully understand the contract. So you load it into chat GPT and you say, Hey, tell me, tell me what you think of this. And they can do that. It can, and it's not a hundred percent. It shouldn't replace an attorney by any way, shape or form. Uh, but, or if you need a quick legal contract, like I need something that says X, Y, and Z, and I'm not too worried about it being perfect but I just need something simple and I can, I can get it out of that. So there's, there's lots of, of uses for uh, products like this. Uh, you know, another great one is uh, the AI uh, image creation. I use that quite frequently as well. You know, need a, need an idea, need a picture. Um, I'll use Adobe and I'll use uh, chat GPT for that frequently. And also, let's talk about your podcast. You said you have your driving forward, and every Tuesday you have Tuesday trips. Did you create those mainly for fun or mainly for work as well? So I, I did uh, so both. Um, so about a year ago, everyone, a lot of people were saying I needed to start 
building a better voice, uh, making my voice louder in our industry. And I used to do a lot of public speaking and I had stopped many years ago. Basically, when I started GLCS, the, the company I'd worked for previously allowed me to speak in front of uh, large groups of people just based on the fact that, you know, that's the audience I would end up getting at conferences and at, at whatnot. Now, when I started GLCS, you know, it takes a while. So I wanted to start uh, driving forward to clean up my speech a little bit. It had, it had gotten lazy and, and I wasn't clean in the way I was speaking. So I wanted to start it for that purpose. I wanted to start talking about industry issues and getting a larger voice for that. And I wanted to have fun with it. I always, I always liked the concept of, of the podcast. So, you know, we, we, we kicked it off with a couple of random videos. And then last October, uh, we, we solidified it a bit more and we started our first regular episode. Now driving forward is a live podcast. Usually we've done some recorded, but I'd say 98%, 95% plus is, is all live. And that takes a bit of uh, a bit of faith to, to do a live podcast. So um, <clears throat> whatever you say is out in the ether and it's it's just out there. So I, I enjoy that a lot. Um, you, you're going to say something? Yeah, are you planning <laughs> on doing more frequent episodes? I do one every week on driving forward. So that's been uh, uh, all in all between Tuesday trips and driving forward. There's about 80 episodes out there right now we've done some weeks where we we go live almost every day we do on sites at uh, conferences we've done several of those where it's a multi-day conference back in march we did two back-to-back -back conferences and uh, uh so it was almost a week of every day going live for an hour and we'll pull in all kinds of different people together into that con or at the conference and we'll just bring them in for 15 minutes and talk so, you know, we, we ended up with a lot more than just one episode a week. And uh, we're, we're launching another podcast here soon that I'm, I'm actually not going to be on frequently, uh, which is associated with another company that we just launched. It's uh, the company's called Freight Movement. And uh, we just had an event last week with Freight Movement. And the podcast that's coming out is called Another Freight Podcast. Uh, so kind of excited about that one, but I, I won't be a host on that one. I might just be an occasional, uh, uh, occasional guest. Is the freight movement event the one I think I saw some people posting it three days ago. So that, that would be, it. yeah, yeah. That was kind of an inaugural event. We had a, a, a great get together sponsored by TA dedicated here in the Minneapolis area and uh, freight movement is largely just about getting people together. Uh, in the industry. Uh, so transportation logistics doesn't matter if you're a driver uh, in operations and sales and freight tech. Uh, if you're a mechanic, you're, you're welcome to come out and network and talk with peers in the industry and uh, just get together. So that's largely the idea is to, to build networks and local networks. So this is not a national event. So as we pull them up and have different freight movement events throughout the country, uh, they will be, um, you know, popping up in, in cities near you. So we have our eye on Cleveland, on Atlanta, on Dallas, on Chicago, uh, Phoenix. So there's there's a few of them coming up uh, that we're, we haven't got any solidified dates yet other than freight movement will make uh, uh, an appearance at the Minnesota Trucking Association at the uh, annual conference at the end of July. So That's fantastic. And by the way, did you see that when you started your podcast, uh, potential clients trust you easier than when you didn't have one? I would say it's helped. Um, you know, there's lots of people that watch it. So we've had good viewers. Um, we've learned more about ourselves through it, uh, through not only the podcast, but through our viewers are, uh, we have a viewership that's largely, through, the Driving Forward podcast is largely uh, executives in transportation logistics, 
uh, both owners, industry executives, senior leaders, some of and on down, but office personnel, and largely on the the trucking side. So uh, we're starting to kind of bend our messaging to that that side of the industry. And so we used to be large, largely just kind of whatever content we wanted to put up. And we're starting to learn how to do that more and more. But <clears throat> has it impacted sales? Absolutely. Uh, I, I would say it's it's made uh, conversations happen easier. Um, that That's definitely been the case. That's fantastic. And let's go back to the experience that you had. You said you were a truck driver before. Uh, did you enjoy it? Uh, can you share some uh, stories that you might have? Absolutely. Uh, I loved driving truck. I still love driving. I drive whenever I can. So uh, going back, you know, I was 21 years old driving and, uh, you know, technically I was in the industry before that in towing. And uh, so, you know, I drove over the road and I, uh, at first you're a little spooked. My, my first load that I ever took was a load of uh, furniture to Manhattan out of Michigan and probably not the best idea to uh to give a rookie driver a load to downtown manhattan but that's where i went and my second load or it might have been my third load was over the mountains um headed to california with a load of batteries and that was hazardous material and i had to go up over top of some mountain passes instead of through tunnels so but what i really enjoyed about driving was the freedom of the road uh you know getting up in the morning and just kind of being wherever you're at uh i i really enjoyed driving the west coast over the the east coast and you know i still still enjoy driving today i you know i did a road trip here recently where i i was able to drive down to a a conference and I think you're muted. Oh, oh yeah. somehow that happened. I'm not sure. So where, where did you lose me at? Yeah, uh, on the, you enjoy driving on the West Coast. Okay. Yeah. I enjoy driving on the West Coast, but uh, I, I enjoy driving really anywhere. Here recently I was, uh, um, I, I, I went on a road trip to uh, a couple conferences and, uh, what drove my pickup to Louisville and then Nashville and then back. Um, you know, it wasn't in a big semi truck, but uh, it was, you know, in a, in a one ton Chevy pickup. So, but uh, uh, no, I, I miss driving. I miss the freedom of the road. I miss the camaraderie of the road, which I know is different today than what it used to be. But uh, there's lots of, of pieces of driving that I still, still miss today. Yeah, plus the fact that you are able to just, you're required to just focus on the road and not think about any problem that you might have. It's calming. Well, I don't know. Drivers have a lot of time to think and you, you are focused on the road, but you know, you are, you are thinking about everything that's, that's going on in your life. So you, you do have your day to maneuver down the road, but, um, you know, there's there's definitely a lot of time to think. I don't know if you're 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 maybe fifty percent on the road. Um, I might have lost you there. Uh, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Uh, yeah. Can you share with us uh, if you don't have anything else to say on the topic? Uh, do you have any hobbies that you? think would be beneficial to everyone maybe everyone should try your hobby out that you like now sure so i uh well hobbies i have so i am uh i i spend a lot of time on a lake so in the summertime i'm i'm typically on the weekends i'm on a lake although this year has not been cooperative i live in minnesota and uh, we've had a lot of rain this year. So every weekend seems to be rainy. And I think I've been out on my boat two or three times this year so far. So 
Uh, but love spending time out on the lake. Uh, I've taken up golfing. So just anything I can do to take my time, take my mind off of uh, all the the efforts and and uh, issues of of the day. And then I do really really enjoy off roading. So I have a bunch of Polaris equipment, uh, and, and we spend some time off roading. But uh, once again, this year has been full of rain. And uh, the off-roading equipment can deal with mud, but when I mean that Minnesota's had rain, we've had a lot of rain. So <laughs> that's fantastic. And uh, how can you balance? If you have any advice on, especially the tracking businesses, how can you balance innovation and integrating new technologies and the humanity in a business? So balancing the, yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Um, so largely on first and foremost is understanding if you are a business leader is understanding exactly what you have, know the technology that you currently have and that, and then understand the technology that you're wanting to integrate to whether, especially if it's a new solution. Uh, what's the problem that you're currently trying to solve and have that well defined. Don't just go out and buy a solution. Technology doesn't always solve problems. Technology in many cases can actually create problems. But you as the leader of your organization needs to truly understand that problem. And if you don't understand that problem or can't get your head around it, there's people uh like a, an organization like glcs that can help you understand that problem and and plug everything together uh but don't just simply buy technology because it looks good don't don't buy technology because ai sounds like a good thing um you know it is it is very complex so when i entered the industry nearly 30 years ago uh, technology was very disparate, and did not talk to each other. Uh, in some cases it would, but in most cases it was very disparate. We had computers that handled EDI separate of everything else. And, you know, now today EDI is obviously an integration point, but uh, when you look at things today, just ensure that you understand that you have defined your problem very well and that you have have socialized that exact problem to any potential vendor that you're looking to do business with. And then you've made them prove to you that they can actually solve that exact problem and that you understand how they're going to solve that problem. Because if they don't solve it, you're just ending up with a new complex solution that may create a whole bunch of problems in and of itself. And you don't need a more complex level of, of issues. You know, I've seen a lot of managers basically forcing their employees to, hey, I saw this amazing tool, maybe in the Super Bowl, maybe they saw it uh, while scrolling through TikTok. Hey, this looks awesome. Add this to what we're doing. And they don't even know what they're going to be using it for. So that is a scary thing for a manager to do. Yeah, absolutely. And you said the, the, the humanity or the human side of this. And, you know, when you talk people, process, and technology. Um, that's a common thing that I'll, I'll bring up. You know, if you get your process and your technology wrong, your people will leave. Uh, they, they are not going to um, fight through poor process and poor technology. They will for a while if you've been around for a long time and you have good culture. But they're if, if you continue to deploy poor technology, eventually that will degrade your process and it will degrade your people. So it works inversely. So if you have great people, you know, you can have poor process and poor technology and have it have it somewhat function, but you cannot have great technology and poor process and poor people. So, so the people are everything. And if you start deploying poor technology that will degrade poor process and it will degrade great people. That's I'm sorry, if you deploy if you deploy poor poor technology, it will degrade great processes, and that will degrade great people. 
That's fantastic. And let's talk about COVID. How did it affect you and especially GLCS? And I know that you have been around for a while now since 2016. So how did COVID affect GLCS? Well, we, we, we've always been a remote company and I would say it, became, it made us more remote. We, we largely traveled for all of our engagements and coming out of COVID, we, we no longer travel as often. Uh, many of our engagements now are remotely engaged to customers. Uh, we do a lot of on-site as well, but not anywhere near as much as we used to. That's funny. So, oh, yeah, sure. Please go ahead. Oh, okay. So the, uh, uh, it, it's, that, that's been a large change for us. That's been something that uh, is, you know, for many of us that have been doing this a long time, we've, we've had to adjust to that. Uh, we no longer, that, that's a, it's also, a, it's a positive and a negative because the positive is we're not having to travel as much. The negative is, mean, is that we're no longer getting together as often. So being a remote team that you never get together with your team uh, makes it hard to lead a team and develop a team. So um, that so now we've had to to come together with like organizational gatherings instead of uh, uh, getting together at customers more frequently. So um, COVID was was certainly a bit of a bump. The industry was doing well, but uh, on our end of it, I, I'd say we we definitely took some steps backwards. Uh, it took us a few years to to come out of that. And I think that we're a stronger organization because of that. We've, we've certainly, um, we certainly learned a lot. We just turned eight here in June and uh, there's a lot of things I think that you just organically learn as your company gets older and older. And uh, you, you learn how to, to navigate various different uh, um crises. And if you made it through COVID as an organization, you've basically managed the worst crisis that I think any of us have hit in our professional careers. So uh, there's that to be said across the board. That's fantastic. And especially because you have 28 years of experience, what advice can you give to your younger self or to any aspiring leaders that wants to enter transportation and logistics space? Oh, that's a good question. I've never actually had anyone ask me that question. Uh, so advice is learn as much as you can, read books, read lots of books, uh, keep your memory sharp, and listen to those that uh, uh, have been in, in the industry for a long time and listen to all opinions. No one is ever 100% right but everyone has a vast amount of experience and has great ideas. Uh, so, you know, listen, listen, learn, and, and read a lot. That's fantastic. Can you recommend three books that you think would work best or would inspire people the most and why? I would need to pull up my list. <laughs> I'm getting old and I can never, I've been put on that spot a couple of times. So I need to memorize them. Um, there was one that, uh, that comes to mind, which is uh, a book I just finished up and uh, um, I'll pull that up for you here. If you give me one second, um, Jesse Cole wrote a book called uh, uh, fans first. So I just finished that. Jesse Cole is the owner of the Savannah Bananas. Um, and the book is largely about creating a culture that your organization is, well, obviously it's titled Fans First. So um, the book is largely about creating a culture within your organization that is is fans first and very customer centric, very customer oriented. And many people had talked to me about how, how GLCS became a fans first organization before I had even read the book. So 
Um, I was very aligned with that book before um, I even read it. And after reading it, I, I think I've, uh, I probably could have written half the book uh, myself. So it's just the terminology that Jesse uses. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of Jesse and the way that he wordsmiths the book. Uh, so if you have not read that one, uh, it's a fairly new book, but uh, if you haven't read that one, I, I suggest you check it out. Uh, do you have other books that you could recommend? Checking that one out. Um, you know, I also can't remember the names of the books I've read. I don't know why. <laughs> There's a Jack Welsh book that I, that's coming to mind, but I got to look it up. Um, you know, I noticed in terms of culture, uh, if you have a good culture in your company, if there's a problem, people are more willing to look for solutions. And if you have a bad culture, they're more willing to blame others and look for a great exit. Very much so. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's uh, the people that uh, are willing to um, stick with you. Yeah. How's the, the saying go? Um, those people that, uh, that stay with you. Uh, there's a, a quote that also is escaping me, but uh there's a, so the, the other book that I would say is Jack Welsh's book. Uh, it's, it's just Jack Welsh and leadership. So um, I read that one probably 20 years ago. And I've read almost all of Jack's books over the years. And, you know, I, I've always found him to be a very clear and uh, um, articulate leader and, and visionary so uh, i've always enjoyed any book written by jack that's fantastic and one of the other questions that i wanted to ask is what motivated you to actually push push through the challenges that covid poses especially because you most likely had a lot of employees at that time what motivated you to make it true you don't really have any alternative so you uh uh, if you can make it through, you might as well make it through. So um, the alternative is not making it. And I've, I've never really believed in, in stepping back. I, I've, I've been, so this is my fourth business now, um, GLCS, and I own a few other businesses right now as well. But I, I have owned a, and I have failed at a business in the past. So I certainly know what what happens when a business fails and I know when a business is failing and at no time did I feel like uh, GLCS was at that point. And you had brought up earlier, you know, culture and the people and when the people are, are no longer on board, when you, when you don't have something special in an organization, then it's not really worth fighting for anymore. So um, by all means, uh, this organization has has something special to it. I, I feel like we're a very unique, uh, unique company. We have an amazing team of people and it continues to grow that way. And, and while no organization is perfect and we have our ups and downs, we continually have to, you know, slightly reinvent ourselves as we go along. Um, we do so with integrity and we do so as a team and that means a lot so we we hire some amazing people and they they get the job done and we all work together to to get there what's your main vision for the next five to ten years of glcs so in five to ten years um I would, so in 10 years, it's hard to say, I'm, I'm going to be pushing 60 then. So, um, but in, in five years, I think, uh, as, as, uh, one of my guys would say, uh, world domination sounds good, but, uh, so Robert Bain can, can enjoy that answer. But, uh, <laughs> um, I, I'm happy servicing customers, uh, and, and providing value added services. So if, if we grow, that's amazing. 
you know, we, we have been continually very controlled growth year over year. And if we continue to just grow at uh, a 20%, 30% or 40% clip year over year, I am perfectly fine with that. Uh, if we don't grow at all, I'm also fine with that. As long as we remain healthy and we continue to provide a value added service to our, our customers, and we continue to provide good jobs for excellent people. Uh, and in, in 10 years, I'm not, not sure where we are. So, you know, in 10 years, we continue to do the same. We explore all options that are out there and, and we can continue to successfully navigate this industry that's, that's really redefining itself. And uh, especially on a technology standpoint, I, I, I spoke in front of the uh, American Trucking Association the other day and said, are you a trucking company? Or are you a technology company that has trucks? And I said that somewhat jokingly, but in five years, that may not be a joke anymore. It may truly be uh, an accurate statement. If you look at the technology that is, is in the trucks today, there are uh, significant changes than there were 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, the trucks are tracking thousands of data points the trucks are technology platforms today. Uh, they are not just power plants and transmissions that move 80,000 pounds down the road. There's a substantial amount of technology in them, uh, substantial amount of technology. You know, I'm seeing yeah. jobs uh, day in and day out becoming more just like a AI operator for that certain thing. Which is right, and uh, I, I see that happening. Um, but you know, largely dispatch or or monitor system monitor for AI. I mean, that's that's the way of the future. I think is as we continue to get AI bots, and as we continue to. So, if you're a customer service person, if you're whomever, if you're managing a system of AI, and it's going to be an entirely different type of role. So you may manage 20 AI bots and as they deviate out of parameters, you'll put them back into parameters or you'll take over for that AI bot for that transaction. But yeah, that that's certainly a, a way that I think many of us see uh, some career paths going. And then also going beyond that is many companies who are doing you know, more complex integrations right now may become the configure, uh, they, they may move into configuring AI uh, to support many of these solutions going forward. So there's a lot of very smart people that are building these solutions, but there's going to be, uh, there's going to be a need for many people to support these solutions going forward. And it's not going to be your typical, at least, the first round, uh, and, and for many years, it's not going to be your typical uh, your typical person to um, support them going forward and configure them going forward. And one of my last questions is actually, are you fearful or worried about how fast AI is changing or developing and there's no policies being built around it? I'm not that fearful. Uh, you know, the policies will come if they have to. Uh, policies right now will restrict growth. And if we're gonna be in a global market, unless you can have a global policy, all you're going to do is limit one nation from another. And that's going to create a scenario that's going to put us, us or other nations into a very scary situation. So free market and, you know, if if something were to happen that causes an issue, then that causes an issue. But I think we're a long way off from approaching anything of concern like others have. And there are obviously a lot more smarter people that are a lot more dialed in than I am. So I'm probably not the best person to ask that question, but I do always lean towards free market. And I do know that if we limit that market, other, other, 
other countries are gonna gonna run right past us. That's fantastic. And do you have any last advice, uh, general advice for life for anyone who's listening? Just just get up in the morning, keep the best attitude that you have that you can have, and uh, uh, live day by day. So it's always good to, to strategize and and uh, uh, look down the road, but remember that today is today and make the best of it. That's fantastic. And thank you for joining us. Uh, if people wants to find you, where can they find you? Yeah, you can reach me at uh, njohnson at glcs.net. I'm very active on LinkedIn. So look me up there. Uh, happy to respond, but uh, uh, certainly um, you know, look for Driving Forward on LinkedIn as well or on YouTube. You can find us there at Driving Forward Podcast. You know, I bet on your 10th year anniversary in GLCS, you're also going to be celebrating your 500th episode in Driving Forward. <laughs> at, uh, well, we're at mm, nine, 80, 90, somewhere in there right now. So if we have two years to go. I don't know if we'll get to 500 episodes in, in two years, but 300 maybe. So we'll see. It's a lot of work doing a podcast every yeah. week. <laughs> uh, it's a lot of there's a lot of work there. It can wear you out. And then the, the Tuesday monologue, that that uh, that can end up being a lot of work. And so the next week is my first week I'm ever taking off. I didn't even take the week off of Christmas. So next week is the first week I've, I've taken off since the beginning of November. And uh, it'll be nice to not have to worry about a podcast for a week. Are you going fishing? Yes. I'm going to get on that boat and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use it. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic and i hope you enjoy every second of it uh, that is the plan i appreciate it and thank you again for joining me on this conversation this has been a great conversation and i uh, thank you for your time thanks a lot john that's all for today's episode of the new world podcast we have explored some fascinating topics with our amazing guests shedding light on the upcoming new world if you enjoyed today's episode and today's discussion and want to stay updated the future episodes don't forget to hit that subscribe button to the podcast and if you found value on what we have discussed please consider leaving us a review on your favorite podcast platform remember if you have any questions or topics you'd like us to get to cover or if you are interested in being a guest in the future please feel free to reach out to me via links in or email me at john.paul at aicinics.com and add new world podcast all capital in the subject line so i can see it I always love hearing from our listeners. And don't forget to check out our amazing guests. You can find more information about them by the contact details we provided earlier. Again, thank you for tuning in on the New World Podcast. I know your time is very important and I try to always make the next episode better than the last. Until next time, keep learning, keep growing, keep innovating. This is John Paul Flores signing off from the New World Podcast.